What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, August 19th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, a new era for nuclear power in the United States. Staying along that nuclear thread, we'll go over across the pond. Safety at Ukraine nuclear plant deteriorates after nearby blast, according to the IAEA. Ooh, spooky stuff, folks. We'll stay over there across the pond. Lebanon faces power blackout as clashes with Israel intensifies. Oh, my. Next up, can the West afford to build its own copper industry? I've got my thoughts. We'll see what the article says. And then finally, Novatech set to dock second LNG unit at Sanction Arctic plant. Love a good, the cover image here is absolutely unbelievable. Stu will then toss over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets over the weekend and we'll touch a little bit on rig counts and then do a little mourning for the passing of Endeavor founder Audrey Stevens. And then we'll let you guys get out of here, get back to work. Appreciate everybody checking us out. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, right, let's get rolling for the new era in nuclear power in the U.S. Michael, this is really kind of ironic when you sit back and look at the U.S. Palisades power plant could become the first power plant to reopen in the U.S. after shutting down, potentially signaling a new era for nuclear power. Finally, we need it. This was shut down. This was shut down 40 years ago in operation in May of 2022, but it was due to cheap, abundant natural gas. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love it. Yeah, I saw this one tweet today. I don't have it up in front of me, but somebody said if we discovered natural gas today, it would be hailed as a decarbonizing fuel of the future. So it's kind of unbelievable to see, again, the bait and switch they had. And the nuclear industry has been getting pounded. I love the fact that we're actually thinking about getting this up and running. My only concern is going to be a lot of the ongoing costs associated with it. We know this stuff is getting regulated into obs- obscurity. The real question is, are they? is there enough? Is there enough money to go around? I mean, because the the problem with nuclear right now is it's actually not the lowest kilowatt per hour available because of all the regulations that are put on top of it. So if we're going to turn this nuclear power plant on, but keep all the owner's regulations, I'm not sure what good that does. Well, half the cost is uh, the original installation. And and so when you sit back and say, hey, I'm going to forget about that, though, do what we can't forget about that, though. Oh, yeah. But, you know, when you sit back, one 800 megawatt reactor could provide enough power for 800,000 homes or X number data centers. So when it is dispatchable on demand flatline power. I mean, you can't you cannot buy flatline power at a what if you're talking AI and you're talking everything else. Just dispatchable power a stream is what nuclear is. You love it. Yeah, I, I think it'll be very interesting to know how much, you know, I mean, you're talking about $6 billion in funding to get a lot of these old school nuclear power plants up and running. I hope that's enough money because, again, the big problem with all this stuff is well, that let's you've take got runaway at, costs. Okay, let's take a look at $6 billion if it goes into wind and solar. Six billion dollars goes into wind and solar, and you may only get fifteen percent of that nameplate that you put out there at any given moment. If you put six billion dollars into nuclear, you get a hundred percent of that nuclear power. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with any of this, and I'd much rather this go to power homes than go to power some rogue data centers somewhere. I mean, I think if the trade-off is we get a eight hundred thousand homes powered, I'll take that over you know some low cost data center even though we need data centers but yeah you know, I do love the fact that a lot of this was you know if there's anything that was good that came out of the inflation reduction act which is just such a hilarious name considering where we're at this is some good stuff what's next let's go to Russia and Ukraine Zephora Zephora say heck I dude I have no idea how to say this thing it is Zephora is it I almost sound like a Chickawa out of Oklahoma going Zikawa, Zikawa. Yep. I have no idea how to say it. But anyway, that nuclear power plant that is controlled by Russia and Ukraine is bombing it. And now the Russians are going, hey, we're in control of this thing. Don't bomb it. The Russian management of that nuclear power plant said a Ukraine drone, Ukraine drone dropped an explosive charge on a road used by staff 
yet again, we can see the escalation of the nuclear safety and security dangers facing the plant. This thing is a huge nuclear facility, and it's amazing that they're still fighting over. Yeah, I'm. I, the last thing I want to see is people lobbing bombs at nuclear facilities. I think that's, you know, especially in this part of the world. I mean, it's, I mean, it, this says it in here. You know, this is, you know, Russia's been, I mean, in control of it again. I'm not saying whether or not that's good or not. It's just, it's it's scary. That's all it I'll is. say. I, I just, I hope everybody keeps a level head and not lobbing bombs around nukes. That. Scared yeah. me. Call yeah. up your friend Putin and tell him to back off, Lee, or tell well, him to let it go. I can't, get, I can't get past his his bodyguard there every time because he, he thinks I'm Putin when I walk up and go, hey, hey. you know, I, hey, I do my Fonzie imitation. All, All right, right, what's Lebanon next? Lebanon faces power blackouts as clashes with Israel intensifies. Michael, this is absolutely horrific. The whole Middle East is just going bonkers. The Castro Mediterranean country has been so suffering from severe power rationing for decades as political bickering stales the overhaul to fail to overhaul the entire electrical electricity sector it's they still use diesel they still use gasoline i mean it it's just fuel in in lebanon is critical it's well we have- i think it's it's critical everywhere i mean it's it's right now it's the only fuel that's really working i mean you 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 know there's not much wind and solar going on in lebanon right now this article does point out that they're actually in the midst of their worst financial crisis in de- decades right now that's been going on since 2019 government has defaulted on its international debt and there's not much support going around to support them. So they're okay. they're basically rationing power over them. And you feel sorry for all the people that are, you know, all the citizens right there. Because that's always, as we always point out, that's who takes it in the shorts. Exactly. I, I don't care what country you're from. It's the citizens that we care about. And, and let's keep a, a level head on here. This next article, as we move, move to the next article here, can the West afford to build its own copper industry? And, you know, you know, the this is from Irina Slav over and she writes this for oilprice.com. I don't think we can. And I the amount of copper that we need in order to bring on all of the AI and all of the electronics and electrify everything and do away with all electric car uh, to go move to electric cars. We need to double the grid by 2040, and it's been 100 years to get where we are now. We don't have that kind of copper in outside of the West. Copper, the key transition metal hit a price of 11000 per ton a couple months ago. Your buddies over there at Goldman Sachs called just a few minutes ago and forecasts could surge all the way to 12000 as electrification really gets going. Holy smokes. No China, no transition, Wood McKenzie said in a blunt new report about the global state of copper. Wow. Well, it's it it it, it gives you reason to pause and, and and it you know it sends a little chill down your spine to think about the fact that, you know, in this new economy, in this new commodity economy that we're we're going to, China will be the dominant player. And, you know, copper is critical to a lot of this transition. It's up there. With lithium, it's up there with all those other critical minerals that we talk about. And the issue is really the fact that you can't just spin up a copper mine overnight. And even if you could just spin up a copper mine overnight, you actually have to have copper there. And that's a little bit more about from the United States is how much copper do we actually have here? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's It takes 20 years for – I talked to David Blackman about this the other day. 20 years for a mine to come online. Yep. <sighs> So it ain't going to happen. Yeah, Let's go to Novatech. I, Last one. I love me some good Russia stories. Novatech. I, do you, you remember four years ago when I was at Intercom and I met one of the head guys at Novatech? He actually came into a New York conference and he was cool cat. I enjoyed talking to him and it was, it was a lot of fun. But Novatech set dock at second LNG unit at sanctioned Arctic plant. They don't care. They have a third train coming on, and this thing is going to be pumping it out. And you take a look, that satellite picture imagery of this thing is it took four months to drag the dock over 
from where they built it to where they're installing it. And let's see here, how much are they going to be putting in it? It was originally designed to have three production trains with a total capacity of 19.8 million tons a year. That's a lot of LNG, man. Well, I, I think Russia is realizing that I think they've seen Saudi Arabia and what Saudi Aramco and all of these Middle Eastern national oil companies are doing by locking in long term LNG contracts. It's one of the few ways to make LNG profitable. I mean, you look around, especially in the United States right now, I mean, natural gas is not a prop. It's a byproduct of what you want to get, which is oil. But in right. terms of what's going to be long term future from power locking in these long-term contracts is critical i think russia they're just giving everybody oh. a mi middle finger and saying hey we're doing this hey we're doing hey. It. we're doing this you know and and i'll tell you we need to get Hen Hen henry winkler on the show the original fonzie to try to teach us how to do a better P putin but when we sit back michael and take a look you know putin could care less and he's doing what's right for russia he may be an animal and he may not be a good guy, but he's doing Russia first. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't disagree there. I mean, it, it's just like Canada is finally, if they would take care of their LNG and they would export to Asia, the price for Asian LNG is going to double in the next few years. The demand for LNG in Asia and Canada could be a huge supplier there. Well, Canada's moving solely to solar, so they'll they they'll be out of the picture soon. Holy smokes! <laughs> no, they won't because they've got too much oil there. Trust me. It's we we could get into all this. You got anything else? Uh, we're gonna have a great week. Hey, by the way, the Democrats are gearing up for their convention today, so this will be a big big day. Buckle up. Yeah, are you gonna go? Are you are you? You're not flying to Chicago. No man on the street interviews. No, you didn't get the I'm gonna, invite. I'm going to avoid some donkey pox. I do not need to be anywhere near. Oh, monkey pox. Excuse me. Not donkey pox. My apologies. But I just saw two, two really funny tweets. They've already got bricks light up for the 100,000 Antifa people they're expecting. It, instead of a gift bag with cookies. They're handing out gift bags with bricks. That's funny. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go ahead and jump into the finance section, guys. But before we do that, we'll go ahead and pay the bills. As always, the news and analysis that you just heard is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www dot energy newsbeat.com. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Hit that description below all the links to the timestamps, links to the articles that we cover. You can also check us out at theenergynewsbeat.substack.com. As always, we are also partnering up with our friends at The Crew Truth, Pecos Country Operating, and Ray Trevino to bring you exclusive access to pretty awesome oil and gas investment. If you've ever considered trying to get in and getting in on the ground floor of an oil and gas investment prospect, we have an awesome, awesome project that's going on right now. Go ahead, and it's in that description below there at the bottom, or you can do investinoil.energynewsbeat.com. For more information, we will get you hooked up with all of the info you need to officially become an oil man. But let's go ahead and just dive in quickly. You know, overall markets on Friday, actually, from a finance perspective, did well. You know, naturally, commodities didn't do great. S&P 500 was up about two tenths of a percentage point. NASDAQ fairly flat, only up about tenth of a percentage point. Two and 10 year yields actually tumbled with a two year down one full percentage point. The 10 year was only down about three, seven tenths of a percentage point. Dollar index down about six tenths of a percentage point. Bitcoin still below 60,000, 59,500. Crude oil shaved off about three percentage points. We were all the way up to basically, we were slightly above 80 on Wednesday. Things tumbled all the way down to end Friday at 75.54. Brent oil only shaved off about a half a, or one and a half percentage point. So it's at 80.08 right now. Natural gas shaved three percentage points down to $2.12. I mean, really on the natural gas side, what we saw was a lot of, you know, cooler forecasts coming in. I mean, if you're sitting right now, as I am in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, today is absolutely the hottest day that we've had in multiple weeks. Now, I think we're going to see 105 on the on, on, on the scale. So I'm, you know, I'm trying to, I'm staying alive here, guys. I still haven't quite acclimated yet. So good <laughs> luck to everybody who's staying strong out there. You know, I, I, th I think a lot of this, 
you know, a lot of what's tempering down on the oil side prices with the fact that most people are expecting China to have a slump in demand relative from where their expectations are. On Thursday afternoon, the China went ahead and dropped some economic data, which shows that new home prices fell at their fastest pace in nine years. And also industrial output slowed with unemployment on the rise. So multiple, multiple people, you know, you know, again, as sentiment around that demand goes, it, it could be good. We also did see OPEC this week on Monday cut its forecast for oil demand this year, specifically citing the softness going on in China. We also saw the IEA saw, cited that same week demand outlook and slashed its 2025 forecast on Tuesday. So again, the sentiment not going well. Andrew Lipow, he's over there with Lipow Oil Associates. It's been a volatile week in the oil markets. On one hand, you had fears of supply disruptions from a wide Middle East war, but on the other hand, slowing growth in China forced revisions of multiple demand forecasts. We did see, you know, at the beginning of the week, we saw prices rally mainly as we were all bracing for retaliation by Iran over the Hamas leader being killed in Tehran last month. But Iran really hasn't done anything, Stu. So on, on Sunday afternoon, the stuff I heard, the stuff you heard into Monday was Iran was coming full force with an attack. They didn't do anything. Where does that stand right now? Not sure. I think everybody's sitting back and kind of going, we thought you'd already attacked. There is so much going on right now. We have, everyone is saying that this may be a coordinated bluff and there are troops movement on Taiwan now. And now everybody's sitting there going, think about it. We just pulled a ton of our fleet out and it's now circling in the Mediterranean in support of Iran, and we are now light on Taiwan. So if you want to think about a messed up world right now, I have no clue what's going on. Well, that's not good when you don't even have a beat on it. The other interesting thing we saw on Friday is rig counts. We shed two rigs in the United States down to 586. That's down 56 from a year ago. Canada saw no rigs added, still sitting at 217. Internationally, we saw 23 rigs get shedded. So, you know, it's finally dropped below last year's um, high over there in internationally. So something's happening here. I think the, 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 the world is bracing, I think, for, for from an international side, I think bracing for a lower overall Brent price. The United States, we haven't seen rig counts rise relative to where you would expect it to be with $75 oils. I think, you know, people are trying to prepare for some crazy volatility. So there's a lot to go on. Things are only going to get crazy. What should people be worried about this week, Stu? Well, I'll tell you what, let's watch the Democrats go through their circus. I still have the firm belief that you can cannot have 100,000 known Antifa members show up in, in the Democrat Chicago. It is now boarded up. I am serious that they have now issued a, a several locations for bricks for, for them to pick up. I think that Kamala and her VP are going to be removed. I think you're going to see a change. I, I don't know what's going to happen. Hey, she is an entertaining cat. Yeah, interesting. Well, I I have no insights into that. I'm doubtful that. Happens. The financial side of the world is what's got me kind of really kind of worried is China is really, they've got, Japan has 40 banks that are in the process of failing. Japan. China has a financial real big issue in their world coming around the corner. And whenever you have that kind of finance issue in, Ch in China going on, they go to war. Historically, it's been a really bad sign to see this kind of thing matching up. Well, I hope I'm wrong. Let's hope I don't have to broadcast live from the shores of Taiwan as I get drafted. Let's just hope we don't, it doesn't come to that. You're too young. I mean, too old. Good. <laughs> Aren't you too old? I don't know. I don't uh, know. I would go for you. Yeah. If you could, if you could walk, you, you they would draft you. If you could walk, they'd get you. All right. So, I, so yeah. I well, guys, with that, we're going to go and let you get out of here. Get back to work. Appreciate you guys checking us out here on the world's greatest podcast, energynewsbeat.com. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.